also gives me great pleasure to introduce Angel Grauholtz, an artist who I admire immensely and who is also a very dear friend. I have a, a little narrative where, that I want to contextualize uh, um, what I think is Angel's contributed to the photography community and the arts community. But first, I didn't know where actually to fit her accomplishments, her specific accomplishments into this narrative. So I thought I'd begin, uh, start that at the beginning. Um, most of you know that she has a, a long and storied history as a, a, a contributor to the photography community. Some of you know that she also has done a lot of work in design. She has, she presently um, teaches at the Ecole de Design at UCAM. Uh, typography and photography, and has done so since 1988, and recently has just ended a position as the director of design at UCAM from 2008 and to, to 2012. She um, comes from a background in design and literature and linguistics, and she's also a graduate of the MFA uh, photography uh, department, um, photography, MFA in uh, studio arts in photography. So she's an alumni. Uh, she's been had many exhibitions over the years, uh, large and small. Some of the key exhibitions uh, 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 were the Sydney Biennale, Documenta 9, the Carnegie International, uh, and the Montreal Biennale. Among the uh, many prizes that she's received and awards she's received, most recently the Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts 2014 and the Prix Paul-Emile Bourdois for Accomplishments in the Arts in 1995. So, um, and some of you may know Angela's contributions to the world of contemporary art and photography are many and varied. As an artist, teacher, designer, curator, organizer, and mentor, she has had something to do with almost every aspect of cultural life in Montreal since she arrived here from Hamburg in 1976. In the 1990s and 19, sorry, 1980s and 1990s, women ran this town, at, the very, uh, at least as far as the art community was concerned. And Angela was a half a degree of separation from all the key players. Chantal Pondrian managed Parachute Magazine, for which Angela did design for a time. Michiko Yajima was the name behind Yajima Gallery, then the hottest gallery in town. Angela worked there. She founded Art Text with um, Anne Ramsden and Francine Perrinet, and she was also a member of Optica and a presence at Powerhouse, now La Centrale Gallery. Most signif significantly, along with people like Ramon d'April and Geneviève Cadou, who most of you know because they teach here, um, and for their other accomplishments, um, as well as Moira Davy, Angela's artistic practice helped define a new movement in photography in Montreal, something very new and exciting that rested somewhere between conceptual art and documentary photography. When I moved to Montreal in the 1980s, I sought Angela out because I wanted to write about her work. I'd seen a catalog of an exhibition that Martha Townsend had curated, featuring works with, uh, by Angela as well as Moira Davy and Ramon Depriel. And I was intrigued by the unique manner in which they approached photography, an approach of a very different uh, order than that taken within the photographic community that I just left, that included people like Bob Burley, Vid Inglevix, Blake Fitzpatrick, and Ed Bertinsky, all of whom were just starting off to define what is now, I think, known as a, a sort of Toronto documentary school. And also these, this approach was very different than the community I was entering into. That included uh, documentary practitioners like Gabor Solasi, David Miller, Michel Campo, and Clara Gucci. Um, they were also different, uh, different registered from the contemporary or conceptual documentary uh, practice taking shape on the West Coast. And these were all happening simultaneously, I think, the sort of forming of these very specific approaches to photography. On the West Coast, of course, it included Jeff Wall, Ian Wallace, Arnie, Arnie Haraldson, and Roy, Roy Arden, and Ken Lum, amongst others. Um, it might have something to do with gender, though not in any essentialist way, or something, but that dis defined or distinguished this community in Montreal from the others. Um, but it, Perhaps it, had more, uh, it was more to do with a way of approaching the truthfulness of the photograph with some suspicion that defined the works that started to emerge as a, I think, a definable Montreal style conceptual art documentary photography. In any event, where photography was the medium, a means to an end in these other communities' works, photography seemed to be more like a subject in the Montrealers' works. Certainly that was true of Angela's practice. Angela Grauerholtz sees photographically. It's not that she sees the world as it might appear through a photograph, or as if the pictures or captures are inherently photographic, although I think she does have these skills, and many of her photographic subjects are inherently photographic. What I mean, though, is she has the uncanny ability to see how photographs might work even before she takes them, how they capture an aspect of reality beyond their ostensible subject. What photographs bring to mind over and above their subject, not only what associations they inspire in us, 
but also how they are forever pointing to something else rather than the thing itself. This is to say she understands the limits of their access to what we call reality. For her talk tonight, Angela's going to talk a little bit about, or explain a little bit about her way of seeing. She's going to talk about the relationship of photography and books, books and architecture, architecture and photography. And she's also going to explain something of how we see circles. So uh, please join me in welcoming Angela Grauholz. <coughs> Thanks very much, much uh, Emily. Thanks, Cheryl. That was very nice and great contextualization of, of uh, well, where I come from, what I've done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this belongs to somebody else. <laughs> I uh, have prepared a talk that uh, will talk, uh, take about an hour. Um, it's something I have written down, and I, I do this now because uh, quite a while ago, many years ago actually, um, I went on a lecture tour, and um, until then I had all, always ad-libbed my talks, and um, I just couldn't see myself uh, traveling through the country and giving the same talk five times over without having written something down. I really enjoyed writing things down, and it helped me think through things. So actually, giving a lecture for me is now also a way of um, stopping and um, thinking about things. So yes, I will be talking about circles. Um, uh, in fact, this is the title of my talk, and so I will read it to you. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about a project I developed. Are you hearing me? Hold on. Let's just check that. Is this okay? Uh, a project I developed for an issue of the Nexus Network Journal in 2011. I participated with a piece, a photographic essay really, in an otherwise purely academic issue devoted to geometries of rhetoric in architecture. This somewhat unique opportunity was afforded to me thanks to an exchange over several years with my friend and the editor of this particular issue of the journal, Robert Kirkbride, architect and professor at Parsons in New York, who had just recently published his doctoral thesis on the Gubbio Studiolo under the title Architecture and Memory. For me, the studiolo demonstrates many aspects of the kind of structures, architectural and intellectual, that I'm interested in, beginning with the idea of lieu de mémoire, place of memory, representation of ideas and knowledge systems, and the links or analogies we each make when confronted with such a richly layered work, be it from a historical or contemporary viewpoint or context. Questions with regards to rules, designs, common grounds, agreements, and synchronicities that govern our interpretation and conclusions are just some of the various approaches one could take to understanding our interests and as to how we access, select, mobilize knowledge about anything really to inform our work as artists. For those familiar with the expression lieu de mémoire, uh, it is uh, not familiar, sorry, not familiar with the expression lieu de mémoire. Um, it, it is a term uh, coined by Pierre Nora, a French historian, well known for having directed Les Lieux de Mémoire, three volumes focused on enumerating the places and objects in which one finds the incarnate national memory of the French, which Having read an article he wrote in Representations Number 26, I understood to be a place where some of the historical meanings uh, remain, informing the present understanding, the present understanding of giving of any given place or situation. 
Going back to the piece of Nexus, I was interested in looking at the discrepancy or shift in the mind's eye that happens when we look at what we know to be a perfect circle and the way we see this ge geometric shape in reality and in photographic reproduction. And as such represents an interesting correspondence or parallel to artistic practice as we never really see what goes into a work. And at the same time, as an artist, we don't really know how the work is being perceived by the viewer. The formatting of the essay was perfectly adapted to the given publishing format of the journal. Title, subtitle, author, abstract, etc. Followed by a play with established forms of text and footnotes. The footnotes became the text to read and the images the main body of the text or that which was to be understood and experienced through looking and making connections. This strategy allowed me to play with forms of fragmentation and create a coherent whole by proposing to the reader to fill in the blanks where there were none or many, just like the mind completes the image of the circle where the eye sees an ellipse. It is my intention to use a photo essay from Nexus as a basic structure for today's talk, interweaving it with descriptions and explanations of some of my works in the hope that it will clarify why I'm fascinated with the form of the book, the circle, the idea of the model, and why the ellipsis is a perfect way to connect spoken language and visual language, and at the same time express my preoccupation with the unsaid, the suggested, the anticipated, and the reiterated. The above-mentioned Studiolo is a museum piece, a display case, a thinking room, and it was just one of the many models I collected and examined in the process of amassing an archive, existing in folders, ring binders, digital files, and collections of books pertaining to particular subjects. The archive represents years of experiences and influences that have given rise to a process of collecting and reflecting, culling and editing, and which found its transformation into two works of art, namely the reading room for the working artists and the web work um, at work and play. This is, an ex is now the article from Nexus. Nexus from circle to ellipse, footnotes to a photographic essay. Abstract, photography encapsulates a wide range of experiential and experimental possibilities, possibilities with regards to the rhetoric of visualization and discursivity. The medium constantly m reminds us of the basic geometric principles of perspective, perceived rather than measured, brought into consciousness through basic knowledge without the need to name the phenomenon. It is the image that fills the gap, pronouncing elliptically what we feel, see and conclude, while the subject recounts the story. For more than a decade now, my investigation into the relationship between photography and memory has shifted from larger installation works that have incorporated my own archives of photographs, such as egg log or filling the landscape, to trying to understand how new technologies have changed attitudes and aesthetic expression in photography or image making more generally. Egg log was the second of a landscape trilogy which, beginning with a residency and installation at the Domaine de Kerguenec in Brittany, um, ended with a book called Aporia, a book of landscape. More recently, my investigation have been centering around the reproducibility of the image, what it means historically and in the context of today's art production, 
which has brought me to consider the image with respect to past and future representation, recontextualization, and further developing the possibilities of integrating aspects of presentation and display into the image-making process. My interests have remained constant over the years. The potentiality of any given medium and subject matter, the object of the book as a mental working space, ideas around mnemonic structures as models for creative processes, um, and observations with regards to the individuals, the viewer, reader, engagement with an artwork, seeing, experiencing, remembering. However, a gradual shift to, qu to questioning the practice and systems of photography, as well as the institution of art making itself, became apparent. All the while, my commitment to explore issues around obsession and collecting, and the places and spaces where memory resides, remained strong. And to quote Pianora again, the quest for memory is the search for one's history. We should be aware of the difference between true memory, which has taken refuge in gestures and habits, in skills passed down, and memory transformed by its passage through history, which is nearly the opposite, voluntary and deliberate, psychological, individual, and subjective. Lieu de mémoire a simple and ambiguous, natural and artificial. Indeed, they are lieu in three senses of the word, material, symbolic, and functional. The reading room literally incorporates for me those three elements. Sorry, I'm just checking something. Um, as it is material, symbolic, and functional. On the other hand, the library at the Domaine de Kerguenec, for example, was literally a historic site, a lieu de mémoire, as were the photographs. Once contextualized within the site of the castle, they became, they became photograph, sorry, they became lieu de mémoire, albeit fictionalized. Both photographs and place were able to evoke a memory that can only exist in our imagination. And I feel it should be made clear that they exist only because of their capacity for metamorphosis and endless recycling of their meaning. <coughs> Circular models of urban planning, Paris being oft quote, down to the simple traffic island, introduced centers where there are none, developed entirely from a geometrical plan with streets, conver streets converging to a central point, punctuating the urban landscape, monuments and fountains designate places to be approached from all sides. As objects and in plan, they are typically round, but they are never circular to the eye. The history of the book is fascinating and shows us how an object in daily use adapts to changes in society and industrial process as to importance, practicality, and design. From being one of the most exclusive and inaccessible objects, the book has become one of the most democratic and accessible mediums to entertain and educate, albeit threatened by the new media. The book is still, or might be even more so, subject of exploration and experimentation, apart from tremendous so commercial successes of large publishing conglomerates, for example, or lately. The book generally allows for a linear and non-linear reading. Giving the binding, we are assured that the order of pages is always the same and that we can return to a certain place if we wish to. On the other hand, anybody can approach a book at any given time and open it or enter it out of sequence. 
The book's cir circularity is given by its architecture. We have the front and back cover, the pages, front and back, the binding. The spine of the book literally is the core around which the pages can be arranged circularly. If we fan out the book, we can easily visualize this idea, but the true challenge is to propose the circularity in the content itself, to find a way to connect the beginning to the end. Each of the formal components of the book is highly connotative, depending on the production and materiality of the book. Like format and weight will contribute to a sense of value and importance of a book, design, cover and page layout, production, color, etc., are elements to enhance the book. For the most part, we have learned to read these signs and have integrated them to be able to interpret and quickly form opinions without having to go into too much depth. In fact, in fact, when form and content create a coherent whole, everything rises to the surface and can be read, and consequently layers of meaning can be peeled away with time. The space of the book is a container, an imaginary thinking space. It needs to be used, filled, inhabited, much like architecture. And in a way, I have always looked at photography in much the same way. You may have heard me say in previous talks about my photographic work that through the blur created by a, light, a slight movement, the darkness, the ambiguity of time and location, I hope to open up a space for the viewer to roam within the space of the photograph, mobilizing his or her, her own thoughts and memories of similar spaces or photographs. This presupposes, of course, my own engagement and recognition of the potential for the imagination to step in at the time of taking the photograph and later in selecting it. Some dynamic interplay between the perceived, strange and the familiar needs to be set in motion, and often it is a process of slow recognition and awareness. Similarly, most circular architectural structures are unusual, even curious, typical and atypical at the same time, and for the most part, they can be categorized as containers. Water, reservoirs, towers, cylindrical cages, most bird cages at times with dome-like structures, and of course, churches reverberating with the phrase, God is a circle whose center is everywhere, whose circumference is nowhere. The spaces are measurable, but the experience is not. This is where architecture and photography meet. Like books, photographs have a certain materiality that I had, uh, sorry, have a certain materiality that I had worked with for a long time but which has been eliminated for the most part, uh, for most of us, by the new digital processes. A new set of codes has to be put in place, and this is of course already happening, for us to come to understand this new photographic materiality and reality. One of the reasons I was drawn to working with the Burnt Books, a series entitled Privation, was that having picked up one of the books left in the rubble of our apartment, I realized that one could not open the book anymore. In addition, it had lost its identification and was simply reduced to a sublime, calcified mess that had a color, a texture, a front and a back, with its interior forever hidden, a mystery left to one's imagination. Inevitably, each and every one of these books ought to remind us of libraries destroyed by fire or war, from the destruction of the Great Library of Alexandria to more recent horrors of the Nazi burning of degenerate lit literature on the night of, thir of Thursday, March 16, 1937, in Nuremberg, 
or the annihilation of more than two-thirds of the 180 libraries in Kosovo in the 1990s. In the end, we only need to remember that the loss of books, and with it the memory of these events, means the loss of histories, knowledge, and identities, both personal and cultural. I first set out to simply scan the front and the back covers of approximately 350 to 400 books, which I had recuperated from um, the fire. For the 75 enlargements, I first chose the linen books as they allowed me to classify by color. Eventually, um, sorry, using the scanner as camera and printing one unique copy digitally on arch paper was not only the first time that I used digital technology, it represented at the time for me the only logical and comprehensible form of responding to the loss of analog photography. The scan made the image a true document, pure image, if you want. Meaning is not produced by a photographic gesture and context, it comes from the object. The incongruence of printing one copy only, all the while coherent with the loss of one book, Printing on Irish paper, commonly associated with printmaking, created the desired effect to question the photographic image and its reproduction process. The resulting artist book um, of the complete selection of the circa 350 books was based on the premise that each page um, or each sheet of paper in the book replaced a burnt book. Each page, oops, each page will show the front cover on one side and the back cover on the other side, and therefore reconstitute part of the library in one book. In this case, I eliminated the background um, of the image to bring back the sense of objecthood of each of, of the books. Photography tells us about our experience, enabling verification of discrepancies between the real and the perceived. Our desire to expand perception of the real, starting with the early experiments in immersive environments, such as panoramas, to more recent technological developments in virtual space, also alludes to the speculative aspects of photography. For Bergson, the virtual served as an ontological distinction between the poss possible and the actual. Aligned with the possible, the virtual was posed over and against the actual and the real. Bergson's use of virtual seems to be taken directly from its optical definition, as if he were familiar with the Keplerian distinction between imago and pictura. Bergson turns the optics of light rays into a metaphor for perception. To obtain the conversion from the virtual to the actual, he writes, it would be necessary not to throw more light on the object. Then we have total reflection. The luminous point gives rise to a virtual image which symbolizes, so to speak, the fact that the luminous rays cannot pursue their way. The objects merely abandon something of their real action in order to manifest their virtual influence. This is as much to say that there is, for images, merely a difference of degree and not of kind between being and being consciously perceived. The difference emphasized by Bergson here between being and being consciously perceived becomes the different difference between the real and the virtual. A lecture about her book, The Dialectics of Seeing, by Susan Buck Morse, was an important moment for me while working on the piece Sentencia 1 to 62, as it anchored my interest in archives, 
Architecture and Lieu de Memoire in Walter Benjamin's last and unfinished work, The Arcades Project. And I quote Buck Morse. The covered shopping arcades of the 19th century were Benjamin's central image because they were the precise material rep replica of the internal consciousness, or rather, the unconsciousness of the dreaming bourgeoisie. Benjamin experienced a sense of decay, a kind of time lag that motivated him to start collecting fragments and commentaries and notes, and to arrange them thematically, only loosely, and order them chronologically in files. These 36 files, which he called convolutes, were to be the materialist philosophy of history, constructed out of the historical material itself, the outdated remains of those 19th century buildings, technologies, and commodities that were the precursor of our own era. He wrote, I cannot enter without a chill coming over me without the fear that I never find the exit. The whole center of the arcade is empty. I rush quickly to the exit. I feel ghostly, hidden crowds of people from days gone by who hug the walls with lustful glances at the tawdry jewelry, the clothing, the pictures. At the exit, I breathe more easily, the street, freedom, the present. This description makes me think of our consumer nightmare or shopping malls of today, but in 50 years from now. My own visits to the Par Paris passages, a number of which are still in existence today, some restored, some dilapidated, were often colored with a sense of amazement as an acute awareness of an era gone by is very present. It is a temporal displacement, one feels, as time seems to have been collapsed but then this is really true for the whole of Paris, I feel. I consider the work's intensia a performative piece, um, similar to the interaction with the book. The structure, about six and a half feet high, three feet wide, and seven and a half feet long, reminds one of a monument or a mausoleum with an architecture reminiscent of the famous Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. But it could also be a museum cabinet, as it is literally housing 31 vertical frames or drawers with 62 photographs. Each photograph can be viewed one by one. One side always shows an image of a passageway, windows, doors, etc. The other side are views, photo photographs taking taken looking in or looking out, views of what one sees beyond the frame. Viewing one photo at a time eliminates the possibility of comparing or juxtaposing imaging. Random access is of course possible, like in a book, and we are invited to literally circulate the piece. Each image iterates the framing device invites to see a view beyond the frame and to turn our gaze to the back of the frame to take in another view. The possibility of realizing that the images are overlapping and consequently the images of windows and door, doors or other framing devices are overlapping as well. Proposing an interior empty space a passage further suggests to consider the piece in its entirety or as a whole. The images in Sentencia are almost ephemeral or even banal, in a sense that they are not arresting in any way. They become so through the repetition and insistence, but a certain sense of contradiction persists. Questions as to the value of the image selecting and collecting practices were interesting to me at the time, and so was the inherent idea of the monument to passage. But today I would focus more on the fact that viewing a landscape through a window or a framing device implies a separation. A window breaks the connection between being in the landscape and seeing it. 
landscape becomes purely visual and we depend on memory to know the view is a tangible experience. Hmm. Sorry. Theorizing photography extends into its subject matter and touches as much on philosoph philosophical matters of time and space as on the everyday and its paradoxes. Several of Duchamp's cryptic statements on the transition from the space of everyday life to the four-dimensional continuum suggest that the series of overlapping circles superimposed upon these segments indicate entry into a fourth dimension. For Duchamp, the circle was a figure of dimensional collapse. In a text from the green box, he demonstrated this, sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, he demonstrated this conviction by describing the rotation of a horizontal dividing line, G, that, is inter that intersects a vertical axis. This vertical line suggests a division into a left plane and a right, which are occupied by points A and B. Duchamp attempted to demonstrate the collapse of such a left and right by asserting that the dividing line G may rotate in three dimensions either to the left toward A or the right toward B. But in either case, the continuous path of circular rotation in which one, um, sorry, in either case, sorry, I will retake this. But in either case, the continuum both path of circular rotation in which one meet and meets the other destroys left and right, displacing them by two isomorphic but directionally opposite continuums. I get confused with the two uh, images on the screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Inspired by Alex Alexander Rochenko's USS Workers' Club, which he had conceived for the L'Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et Industriels Modernes in Paris in 1925, it was my intention, with the reading room for the working artist, to expand the idea of the photographic archive to include writing, quotes and passages from stories or essays, poetry, bibliographies, etc., and to create an environment of quiet contemplation by confronting the history and ideolo ideology of the Workers' Club with that of other artists' work and history, my own included. As I mentioned before, while I continue to be interested in known archetypal structures such as Sententia, I began to think of the archive as model, as a place where I could work out notions of appropriation and or citation, history and display. And in that context, the reading room became my model for producing understandable structures for processing ideas. Rochenko's constructed work provided a place, uh, Rochenko's reconstructed work provided a place where the reader, spectator and artist would collide and collude to construct their sense of history and or art history. The reading room takes on the somewhat utopian and at the same time intensely personal culture history for and about art and artists. However, instead of reading about the greatness of Len Lenin or playing chess in order of his memory, we can choose to play chess. Like Duchamp, Anne Man Ray had done on so many occasions. We read and look at all kinds of visual and textual material that directly or indirectly relate to the history of modernist and postmodernist art, literature, philosophy, natural history, and so on. 
and the viewer, reader, become part of a community that has seen, read, and exchanged in a similar fashion over time. Moreover, we also have been given permission to roam around like a flaneur in somebody's memory, able to rediscover in the 12 books laid out on the reading tables our own knowledge and experience of art. Instead of walking through the rooms of a museum or gallery, the spectator has been slowed down through the act of reading. This slowing down is comparable to other modes of contemplative activity like writing, looking, walking, and painting, or partying like this book that I will give you just two or three pages of, which is less contem uh, contemplative, of course. All these uh, uh, photographs that make up the book um, are uh, photographs collected were from from openings or from uh, from literally parties that artists had. Both the photographic moment and the experience of an artwork have been converted to a creative process of assimilation and construction. We are the we are inside the process by which the artist was able to work and create, a process that, in actuality, is far from the traditional notion of inspiration or authentic gesture. For it is, at times, a painstakingly slow process that is subject to the constant reiteration of the inherent tension, the seeming contradiction between change and repetitiveness, between the purely intuitive and the intentionality of adducing new knowledge. Considering the limits the la that language places on expressing the breadth of human experience, we are indebted to Jorge Luis Borges, whose analogy to the rhetorical geometry of knowledge remains unrivaled. I declare that the library is endless. Idealists argue that the hex hexagonal rooms are the necessary shape of absolute space, or at least of our perception of space. They argue that a triangular or pentagonal chamber is inconceivable. Mystics claim that their ecstasies reveal to them a circular chamber containing an enormous circular book with a continuous spine that goes completely around the walls. But their testimony is suspect, their words obscure. That cyclical book is God. Let it suffice for the moment that I repeat the classical dictum. The library is a sphere whose exact center is an hexagon and whose circumference is unattainable. When asked by Vox to collaborate on a project transposing the reading room for the working artist to the web, I decided to develop a spatialized database loosely based on the reading room's archive material. It seemed logical to consider and reflect upon the space of the internet as a place, a site, and a context, and by using the original archive and recontextualizing it uh, the, the collected material within this new environment, I was able to incorporate all of the previous thinking processes through this new medium and at the same time put into question artistic strategies and gestures. Staring at a computer screen is a rather disembodied experience. And I feel that the task was essentially to move from a very physical, tactile world that mobilizes the imagination, the library, the reading room, the book, to an imaginary space that I believe lacks the integration of known, if you want, real human experience, such as real sensations that go beyond stimu stimulus responses and navigational internet behavior we have become so familiar with. For me, the way we negotiate virtual space is very closely related to the way we construct our world view. 
Furthermore, the archival impulse in artistic practice seems to me to stem from two opposing anxieties and or desires. That of losing one's own memory, and therefore losing one's valuable time invested in the accumulation of knowledge, and a simple appetite for accumulation. Both of these impulses ultimately threaten a loss of meaning. Both suggest a void, the former an emptying of historical experience through attrition, the latter an obsessive tendency that may produce an abundance but is ultimately meaningless. Here again, the art world mirrors a larger societal obsession toward the overproduction and overconsumption of images in the respective diffusion on internet sites, sites such as Facebook and YouTube. Although I probably share the same anxieties and desires with everyone, my interests define themselves in the process of production rather than the impetus for collecting. As I go through reading and researching, selecting and focusing, encircling ideas, letting go, revisiting, the different thinking processes that shape my practice is what interests me. And of course, whatever I can learn in that process is what drives me in all of this, along with a sense of play. My first impulse in looking for ideas to structure and construct the web piece was to seek out the possibility of creating a form of architecture analogical to the idea of information architecture, representing structured as well as unstructured thought processes, or, if you will, illustrating essentially the way we think in fits and starts, between chance and deliberateness, forgetting and finding again, and simultaneously being able to create links between apparently disparate elements. In considering the construction of this imagery storage facility or housing for an interactive internet site, an ancient mnemonic device, the memory palace, offered a perfect model. I'm only going to read the red part. In the ancient Greek arts of the rhetoric, of rhetoric, or rhetoric, sorry, memory was a science. The memory palace, based on the principles of the method of loci, functions as a model to facilitate memorization and recall. The use of loci within a system produced a sort of memory, which one could enter from an infinite number of places, and thus one can work with it change it about, shuffle, go backwards or forwards, or jump around. Spatial positioning of thoughts as an aid to memory turns out to mirror our natural thought processes of cognition, and by the same token, mirroring the organization of, for example, a library system, or by extension, the internet. I consulted with a good friend, graphic designer and architect, Louis-Charles Lanier, who helped me think through the idea of building a structure and, a layer lay and laying the groundwork for the site. We realized that while many ideas regarding the architectural design for a memory palace have potential, and as such represent the very notion of the different forms of the, palace, the palaces could have taken, the palaces were in fact never built and they ultimately should remain in the realm of ideas, or of a somewhat indeterminate nature, constantly proposed, structured and restructured, played with and discarded, much like one would play with, play with or develop ideas and concepts. At the end of any of these sessions, we would uh, get, uh, we would say, but do we have architecture yet? And no, we didn't. Simultaneously, I began to explore architecture as modular space, folded space, or folded space going back to the space of the book and its construction from folded broadsheets, a form of modularity that is also structuring the physical aspects of the book. 
develop new organigrams, classification systems, and family trees, to find the internal structure for the database, which seemed as elusive as the architecture. This was all a very, very long process, and for lack of time, uh, something I cannot really get into in any depth, but essentially these were the key elements necessary for the programmers to go ahead and construct the site. And again, the process by which I arrived at the synthesis of all the various possibilities that I played out and toyed with was by far the most interesting aspect for me. By deliberate omission, by creating a gap, we open up a space, like a parenthesis or the ellipsis in a sentence, and our imagination steps in to fully inhabit the space to be comprehended. Fragments become repetitive of the whole, while reiteration helps us to dwell on the various aspects. For the self-exposed, to the meaninglessness of existence, the circle is an orientational pattern that can impose coherence on the infinity of being. It transforms the infinite into unity, either through the beacon of a center with reference to a potential inclusive whole, or through the comprehensive totality of a circumference with reference to a center thus potenti potentially defined. The self is experienced only through its thoughts and actions, which appear to it as a continual process of expansion toward a circumference that it is the fullness it lacks. The, the three final structural elements of the site are the database of approximately 4,000 images and texts and its nine square grid that functions as the navigational interface. Um, the memory palace, if you want, which is, um, that is the timed result of each visitor's journey transposed into drawing. And you see that on the little green uh, square on the bottom of the image. And what I call a perpetual motion machine, a film that envelops the whole um, idea of the piece, um, a fi the film Ephemeris that was also used in the uh, reading room, which creates actually a continuous loop and which accompanies the viewer, um, if only through the soundtrack. There are nine portals or entry points into the site, with which each are one of the final umbrella subjects uh, in the form of verbs to structure the content of the database. Collect, construct, create, write, sense, dying, think, live, and tame. Um, I like this is a postcard for, that I found at the CCA of some kind of uh, obscure uh, archive, but I really like it. And it kind of um, pictures uh, the structure of um, the database for me with um, the kind of entry points um, that are structurally between a container that is invisible to us and um, an outer layer light, which I see is sort of represents the film that I used. Anyways, I, I'll go further into this. Um, uh, I show this organogram again um, bec simply because uh, to understand that behind all these um, terms are all of these um, well, much more, obviously. I'm just giving it sort of excerpt from the organogram. Uh, I don't even remember. I think there are 28 different entry points once you're inside, and then under those are 
many, many hundreds um, subdivisions. So that's just to give you an, an, a kind of idea. So we have for collect archive and for construct architecture. But in within architecture, you have uh, things like utopia, ut utopia, uh, something on Thomas More, Buckminster Fuller, and so it goes goes in uh, further and further. Um, I do have some some more stuff written down uh, on the structure of this, but this was uh, an early drawing um, that I produced with uh, Louis Charles Lanier and. Um, uh, where you can visualize again this idea uh, of the the original um, model or imagination of what what we thought we were um, doing. Um, I think key to this is always the uh, the little square on the bottom that traces um, your visit and um, can be quite erratic at times when you jump from one category to another. The interface, a nine square, nine, nine square framing device, becomes an element that is designed to focus our intention, attention. It is elastic, but systematic, and it does not prescribe choice to be made, but rather encourages the viewer to make decisions as to which path to follow. There are references to orient ourselves supplied at the at all times in the margins of the frame or window, such as item or negative. You can see that on the, on the right-hand side. Um, the film, or a perpetual motion machine, and outer layer or container stands for the ongoing stream of consciousness, as well as the flow of information, life, anything really that goes on without us driving it. It needs to be stopped rather than activated to access the interface and inter inner core, the database, much like we have to stop our own, our own ongoing mental process in order to be able to focus. This is what you encounter when you, when you enter the, the, um, the database or you stop the film. A passage in Francis Yates' book, The Art of Memory, about Ramon Lull's Ars Memorativa, struck me as particularly true in thinking about a possible analogy between brain, thinking, and navigating on the internet. In it, Yates described Lull's introduction of movement for the understanding of memory as a representation of the movement of the psyche. My understanding relates this back to the constant move, moving of our thoughts, connect, connected equally to the emotional and mental faculties of our minds. This idea of constant involuntary movement of the psyche seems to be in direct opposition to the linear, logical, and structured fashion computers, and by extension the internet, is set up, but is perfectly suited to express a more fluid and intuitive approach. The visitor may return to the film loop at any time, but does not really know the length of it, unless he or she takes the time to view the film completely, and which would then be recorded in the little green square at the bottom of the screen. Uh, timing and visualization, visualizing the visit while navigating as a full circle. This is the very beginning. Um, I had a full circle before, I think. We already encountered the idea of work and play suggested by the activities named in each portal in the reading room as the ideologically infused learning and leisure, which became, just like the idea of the model, a point of departure and a light motif for me. The website becomes a creative template onto which we could measure and project our thinking and doing, a way to describe a process of research and free associative wandering. Our inherent need for community as well as isolation, mobility and immobility, challenge and facility, etc., somewhat finds a reflection in the open-ended nature of virtual space. Much like the reading room, 
I had hoped the site to be a space to reconnect to a larger community through, that, through what we have seen and read collectively. Almost there. The returning figure of the circle, the loop, the sphere, is a visual and iconic, is as visual and iconic as it is metaphorical. And by the same token, the ellipses, most often represented by the gaps and the various jumps we encounter in navigating through the database, become meaningful through a kind of slippage, décalage in French, continually creating conceptual tensions, encouraging the spectator to solve the puzzle, so to speak. A puzzle that really is of his or her own making, as the spectator is invited to appropriate the visit for his or her own means and interests. For me, this simply means that I hope that one takes the time to open up to new and surprising juxtapositions that may change our habitual ways of seeing and understanding things. The potential for this type of slippage, shift or disjunction functions much like synesthesia through evocation of the senses, a superposition of surprise, shock, rejection, or joy, or as a rhetorical device to mobilize the intellect to challenge, question, critique, and discover, further overlaid by the visitor's mental contributions. At the end of the visit, uh, or if you decide to stop, this is what presents itself to you. And if you then decide to construct, um, you construct your own memory palace. palace. Much like in an archive of photographic negatives, at the end of our meandering, we can revisit our stops by clicking on the encoded numbers appearing on the top of the window. And we can visualize the experience spatially as the locations are highlighted in the isometric graphic. Finally, we may want to reward ourselves and produce one last virtual document, a screenshot of our last window of our personalized memory, uh, memory palace. <coughs> Normally I would end here, but I decided uh, just yesterday that I have a little addendum. Um, I realize that in this talk I don't really um, show much of my more recent photographic work, and um, since there is a show on right now in, in town, um, you might want to go and see that, but I thought I'd give you a couple of images that I have produced over the last um, six years, approximately. But I do also have a website that you can visit if you're interested, and um, I look at this website um, sort of as, a, as an archive. Um, it's a real good tool for me because now I have everything in place and I don't have to search everywhere and all the time for certain things. <coughs> and I can refer people to this website. Um, it includes um, um, much more elaborate documentation on m most of the pieces, um, research. Um, you can even visit all the books that are in the, uh, in the uh, reading room. And uh, just about all the photographs I ever produced are reproduced on this website. So uh, here it goes, just a little final addendum. Of course, the switch from um, what I did before, which was mostly black and white, the biggest change for me was trying to photograph in color and um, convince the camera somehow to do what I 
like to do in, hand, in ha handheld situations. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't, and it didn't matter anymore. I just simply um, began to enjoy working um, on photography again in quite a different way than before. I had stopped photographing altogether in, I would say, around 1998 and picked it up again in 2002, approximately. But it took me a long time until I actually started putting things out. Um, and that's more recent stuff from this year, actually. What I like about digital photography is really that you can interfere with the image and clean it up and change it. You can change the color, you can do all kinds of stuff. So it becomes a whole different and new medium for me and brings back the fun of it too. Et voilà. Um, I've seen your work from before, that you have a strong photography practice, and it seemed that later on you discovered the archive images as a tool to uh, explore this notion of culture that you want to, uh, I think that interest in your work. And I was wondering, now that you've taken back to personal uh, photography practice, if you see your images themselves as an archive already at the moment you take them, if you think of the viewer, a viewer that would look at your images in like 50 years, and if this material you produce is some kind of an archive for the reality of today. Not at all. I see it very separately, actually. I, um there's a big separation, uh, simply, um, I think a lot of the photographs that I do, uh, ha like all the color photographs, have never been shown but once in, in a museum, and I show them only in commercial galleries, so it's, it's a, I think that gives you an answer to that. And um, It's a way of financing the other stuff sometimes. Um, it, uh, but that doesn't take away from its value for myself. It, it, it really is you know, something that I like doing. The archive, the impulse to do archives originally, um, which is like you know, almost 20 years ago, I, it was um, that I started getting tired of, um, of photographing and, and felt that I was uh, really repeating myself. So. Um, and that there was so much stuff that I had photographed and collected that just never got out there. So I started to think about that and what, what am I doing with all that stuff? And, and it's just kind of naturally happened that I flowed into um, doing these um, containers or fictionalizing stuff and, and, um, and then eventually it, it ended up in the, in the reading room. So it was a very slow process actually to get there. And um, I continue to, to think about what it really means, what I'm doing on that part of my practice. And uh, the other part is really, um, um, no, it's not meant, you know, I don't photograph it for, for the archive per se. But of course I'm accumulating a ton of stuff again. <laughs> So, who knows, maybe it will go there. Mm -hmm. Well, is there no question? Yeah, no, you're not. You're not asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that everybody can do that by themselves, and it's a very slow process because um, to really make it effective, you have to watch the movie a little bit, and then um, you know, I, I think it's very easy for everybody to do that by themselves. 
But if we have a consensus, I can obviously I can do it. But I'm not sure I can hook up my computer here. I don't have a pass. I, in my view, it is one of us possibly, but it might take a little bit of setting up. Yeah. I find I find actually showing stuff on the net uh, also when I'm teaching um, is is slows things down tremendously unless you practice <laughs> like crazy so that you know which button to push and where to go and um, so um, I don't usually do that but I do show actually I do show the um, the website as an exhibition piece I, I'll get to you right um, and it works quite well. And uh, recently, I, I showed it in Germany, and um, there was there was a big group show, and there was no space left to show it, and it was announced, as, and so I finally suggested to show it in a, in a room, not not unlike this one, um, only it was much funkier than this one, <laughs> so it was really quite great. So people had to go. And we, we took half of the chairs out, and then you know people went to a little ch little table and then started navigating. And actually, uh, they liked it. It was fun. <laughs> so sorry. Um, I had a question about uh, the relation of uh, for his um, his his library and the website that you made, um, particularly related to. Uh, Manifest manifestations of, of architecture. I, I find the, the insertion of Bergson in this to be really interesting. Um, and so the question is sort of twofold. The first the first thing is, um, do you see the uh, library as uh, sorry the archive that you construct online um, as <laughs> Tim will like this as a sort of like a, a finite or an or an infinite gesture? Is it, is it a, a representation of all the possibility of information um, as Borges sort of describes, um, sort of being pulled up and made real, um, so in, in a sort of Bergsonian, Bergsonian sense, mm -hmm. um, pulled to the forefront of, of perception? Is, is, that, is that the function of that, of that tool? I think or? the key is somewhere to, uh, to uh, think about that in the uh, um, supposed infinity of the internet, I mean, it, it probably has a, is not infinite, but you know, um, that w we probably need to formulate more and more uh, finite ideas. But since I was trying to work also into this piece, an experience of the in internet, um, uh, it had to have enough, inf uh, enough uh, stuff in it to make it seem infinite. So I wanted to have that kind of ambiguity, really. But the, but the architectural representation that comes at the end of that journey is, oh, yeah, okay. is a very finite gesture, right? Like a, I mean, it, as in, it, it well, it's finite it. only for that moment because you can back go back in and you can you know sort of add to it and stuff like that. So it's like uh, it becomes you know a finite to that visit, but not necessarily um, forever. Mm. So it it stays also it hovers you know between um, something final and and not. Does that answer it? I think it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what was your biggest challenge going from black and white to color? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have no idea. Wait a minute. I, I think just finding the impetus to start continue photographing and wanting to make color images because for the longest time I had absolutely no no wish to make color images. Um, the 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 kind of distancing um, and abstraction of what you photograph through the black and white and and the materiality and all that gave something so specific that um, was impossible to to uh, to do with digital imagery. So, you know, it's not, not that easy to try to reinvent yourself with 
it, it's like you know, a, a, you start start over again basically. So it wasn't obvious for me that I could make images that would still mean that I made them. So you you um, because you said like I had to switch the color, but you didn't really have to. Like you chose to do it. Um, well, I don't think it's logical to, um, um, and I say that often to my students, you know, who say, well, can I take black and white? And I say, well, what kind of camera are you using? Well, my digital camera. Well, I say, well, that camera, you can switch to black and white, but what for? That's just a gimmick at that point. But, um, you know, with black and white film, there was still some kind of sense behind it, and historical, obviously, also. Um, and uh, yes, you can still choose to do black and white imagery. And I still continue making black and whites, which are scans from black and white neg negatives, but they're never just a flick of the switch. In the memory palace, the, the green thing down, did you say it was monitoring time? Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, just the, what, what was the, in that, or why was it different? Well, it's a form of, it's a, it's a way to visualize your path. Um, and so you, at the same time, have, you know, a drawing, which is, of course, two-dimensional, but you have also an idea of a th third dimension because it, it's the timing is somehow always alludes to that other dimension. And then when you can actually construct it in three dimension virtually, um, you know, you, you kind of get into that idea of space a lot more. In the visualization of, of the, the path at the end, we see that there's possibility for the points to be outside the circle. And I was wondering about yeah. That access to the outside of this circle that's been contained. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to explain that. <laughs> um, actually, you know, the way I visualize it as, as, as the, the film going around it, that's just, you know, a way for us to understand it. But actually, it could be inside it, too. It could be, go from the inside out. And we can imagine that the archive is actually spreading out around it. So the two spaces are inter interchangeable if you if you really think about it. I, I mean, I just fix it so that it's easier to explain. <laughs>